grace, mercy, and peace to all of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, very randomly and with no reason or rhyme whatsoever, I'm going to do something different today out of the blue. Instead of talking about the lectionary text, which are good texts, forgiveness is an awesome topic to talk about. Um, I want to do something different because this past week, I, well, last couple of weeks, I was on vacation back home in Houston, and last Monday was the 22nd anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, and it touched me because as I'm going around Houston, you couldn't turn on TV, every local channel was talking about memories and all of the things about 9-11, and all over the radio, 9-11 tributes were constantly pouring in. I was trying to listen to sports talk radio, and even they were talking about memories of 9-11. It was just all over the place. So I thought that I would take a week to talk about that from a religious point of view, in light of this reading from 1 John 4, verses 13 through 19. By this we know that we abide in God and God in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God therefore abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because God has first loved us. And that is our text. And the message today is entitled, Where Was God? Dear friends and beloved brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, there's those events that happen in history, some good, some not so good, but they serve as markers in our lives. We... When they happen, and the memory of them happening, it causes us to think back to where we were and what we were doing when we heard the news of what had happened. In my lifetime, um, from 1994 to 1999, I spent those periods of years, I had a job where I drove professionally in Houston delivering things. And so I used to listen to a lot of radio all day long. I remember one spring day in 1995, a report came over the radio that somebody had blown up a federal building in Oklahoma City. And that was bad. And then I was listening to the radio all day again in 1999 when I heard about the shootings happening in Columbine High School in Colorado. I remember being a senior in high school in 1986. And one January day for government class, we were going to gather around the television set and we were going to watch the historic launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger, only to witness that historic launch go terribly wrong because that Space Shuttle blew up, killing all seven aboard right in front of our eyes. I remember hearing my parents talk about watching the first man walk on the moon in 1969. I was just a baby when that happened. I remember hearing my mother talk about doing Christmas shopping in November at North Line Mall in Houston in November of 1963 when word of the assassination of President Kennedy up in Dallas had started to spread. My grandparents have told me of their recollections of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. And of course, you just can't ignore the 800-pound elephant in the room today. Where were you and what were you doing when you first heard about the attacks on our country on September 11, 2001? 
That was a horrible day for me. I was at work. I had an office space job at the time in Houston, and at about 8 in the morning, a co-worker came up to me and said that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. I thought he was joking, or maybe it was just some sort of freak aviation accident. I wondered how that sort of thing could even happen. Well, I turned on the news radio, and then I heard about another plane hitting the other tower. And at that moment, I realized that this was no accident and this was no joke. Then one at a time, the towers collapsed. And I got a real knot in the pit of my stomach. And it continued to get worse because now a report came in that a plane hit the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. You're sitting wondering what's going to happen next. Then there was a report of another plane that crashed in a field in the middle of Pennsylvania. Apparently the passengers thwarted that attack, but who knows where that plane was going to go. And it was seeming that the world was literally spinning right off of its axis in front of my very eyes. It wasn't until the government ordered every airplane in the air to immediately land at the nearest airport, and when the report came in that 100% of them were on the ground and accounted for, then I was able to breathe without fear for the first time. Now, what made that day so terrible is that it appeared that evil had prevailed. It seemed like law and order and goodness had been defeated by lawlessness and evil and hatred, and it seemed like those would be the things that would be the new rule of the land. It was a time of complete horror. People had never experienced that type of havoc on our homeland. Usually that stuff happens somewhere else overseas, but not here. Our sense of comfort and peace was shattered. Our sense of security and invulnerability was suddenly gone. And we started to realize all that we had taken for granted for so many years. People were afraid. It is a matter of fact that the Sunday following 9-11-2001, by record, is the most highest attended Sunday in terms of church attendance in United States history. In that time of turmoil, people were wondering, where was God? Well, it's actually a valid question. Was God with us on that fateful day? Well, the answer, of course, is yes, and he still is. Now, to help kind of sort all of this out in our minds, it might be helpful to think first of exactly what kind of God do we have. Is our God a God of hatred and fear, or is God a God of love and peace? Well, God is a God of love. God loves you very, very dearly. God loved all of the victims of the 9-11 attack very dearly. God even loved the terrorists that carried out the attack. How do you know this to be true? We know this because he sent his son. God loves this world so dearly that he wanted it reconciled back to him. And sin was getting in the way of that. Sin leads to hatred and violence and anger and death. And God wanted sin defeated so that you and I could be reconciled back to him. He wanted to be reconciled with his creation again so badly that he sent his only son to die for you and for me. He gave his only begotten son to us so that through him sin would be conquered. He sent Jesus to take our place and Jesus came to suffer all of the effects of sin and to pay the price for sin. Jesus came to experience hatred and death. 
Jesus reminded us in John 15, verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. When Jesus was here, Jesus was ridiculed, Jesus was rejected, Jesus was handed over to suffer unspeakable suffering and torture leading to his death, even though he was an innocent man. Jesus also understands fear. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen to him the next day. And according to his humanity, Jesus was afraid. Jesus was so stressed out by what was awaiting him that he literally sweat blood. And medical science these days has discovered exactly how much immense stress and fear it takes to cause your blood vessels to actually rupture so that you sweat blood. That takes a lot of stress. And Jesus sweat blood. So Jesus clearly understands hatred and fear, but he died and he rose to defeat those things. But you are baptized into Christ. And Jesus is not a God of fear. Jesus is a God of love. Listen to 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. That is, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And from our text today, verse 14. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. The Father's love for you led Him to send His Son to save you. And the Son's love for you led him to follow through. Their love saved you so that you would not have anything to fear ever again. God is love. Listen again to verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. You don't have anything to be afraid of because you are in Christ, and Christ's love led him to save you, and fear has no place in love. Fear has to do with punishment, but you don't have any punishment from God to come because the Father has already punished the Son in your place. So there's no more further punishment for you to face because of Jesus. You are in Christ. So you have been set free from fear and you are now free to love. Listen to verses 16 and 17. We have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so are we also in the world. So the passage says to you that you have been baptized into Christ so you are in God and God is in you. And as a result of that, you can now have complete confidence in the day of judgment because Jesus has suffered the wrath of God in your place. In Christ, there is no fear. There is only peace, joy, and hope. So, was God really there on 9-11? Well, listen to verse 13. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Holy Spirit. Where God's Holy Spirit is, there God is. Where God's church is, there God is. Where His Word and sacraments are, there God is. Where God's believers are, there God is. God is where His Spirit is, and His Spirit is in His church and in His believers. God was there. And better yet, God never forsakes his children. As he says in verse 15, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. 
God is one with his children, and he has promised he will never leave you nor forsake you. God is a God of truth. God cannot tell a lie. God is completely trustworthy. And when God makes a promise, God will keep it. Listen to his promise to you in Matthew 28, verse 20. Behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is with you always, every day, no matter what, forever and ever, even in your current difficult circumstances, and even on 9-11. So, where was God? God was there. God was leading the firefighters and the police officers to help the survivors. God was there. He was comforting those who lost loved ones with the promise of an everlasting reunion for all who are in Christ. Well, why did God allow that terrible thing to happen? Ultimately, I don't know, and we're probably not going to know this side of heaven, but while I don't know the answer to that question, I do know this. God is always faithful to his promises. I do know that God is love. I do know that even though sin and evil are still at work this side of heaven, those things are only temporary and they don't define our lives or our relationship with God. I do know that come what may, God is in complete control. I know of the comforting promises that he made to us in his word, including my personal favorite chapter, Romans 8. He said in verse 28, we know that for all those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 31, if God is for us, who could possibly be against us? Verses 38 and 39. For I am certain that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's word of comfort for you today is that though sin in the world may bring you fear and pain at times, God is love. And he is eternally with you in Christ Jesus. God loves you very dearly. And he is always, always there. We do wish that he would remove the pain and hurt from our lives sometimes. But remember, he sent Jesus to deal with sin. And as a result, the life to come will be just that. Free from pain, free from tears, free from fear or strife. Nothing but peace and joy and happiness. And even in this life, God promises that he will always take every single tear that is shed and use it for our good somehow, some way. And God never breaks a promise. God most certainly cares about the things that happen in this world, and we close as such, with Jesus' extremely comforting words in John 16, 33. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome this world. In good times and in difficult times, God will always bless you in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until his second coming. Amen. We continue with our prayer hymn number 923.